Wonderful. Okay. Um, I am recording this, this next part because I've had a couple of people say they couldn't be here and they wanted the information. And so um, kind of the topic for this Zoom this time was um, adapting instructional materials. Um, that's been very popular. A lot of times we do that anyway, but with our ESSERS monies, that's been um, something that a lot of people have had. And I have Katrina um, here, and she's going to just share a little bit about how we can help you with that process, things you should be thinking about, um, all those kind of things. So I will let Katrina go ahead and get started. You're on mute. <laughs> there you go. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks, Molly. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've been really busy working with folks from around the state on this process because there are lots of districts adopting new materials. And I'm um, working with a core group of ESU um, PD coordinators and um, leading some specific content groups on the process of adoption. So I just wanted to fill you in on some of the work being done and, and also sort of um, prompt your thinking a little bit and kind of where your district is and where your goals are um, in adopting materials. And so I know there aren't very many of you here, um, but if you'd like, there is a link to a Jamboard. Um, we would love to, you know, get some actual, get some feedback from you on kind of where you are um, and what your goals are. So um, if you want to click on here, you can just click on the Jamboard link in the slideshow and, um, you know, feel free to provide some information for us that we can, we can use to support you. Um, so I just wanted to start by thinking about this why uh, we always have to, you know, go back to our why and when we do make decisions. Um, and so the question was, um, you know, what is your hope for uh, your students? And there's a Jamboard slide for that. But uh, when you think about your hope um, and your vision, um, really it sort of prompts two questions when it comes to adopting materials. Um, what currently guides your decisions when you think about your process? What are the those steps that you um, go through um, and what guides that determination? Um, whose voices are at the table? What, um, what data do you use to drive those decisions, et cetera? And then also reflecting on the question of um, are the tier one materials, your curriculum, your policies, and your procedures that are in place in all content areas, are they guaranteed viable in movement toward fulfilling this hope that you have um, for all of your students? And we know that that tier one is that all of our kids, um, and it doesn't matter what content area it is. So those are just sort of reflection questions um, to to consider and and I will um, be quiet here for a second if if anyone has anything that they'd like to share about these questions um, and kind of where your district is um, at the moment with adoption. Anybody have a thought that they'd like to share? Okay. Um, well, I don't know why my slideshow is just beeping at me instead of advancing. And weird. So we will just do this. That's very strange. Okay, um, so then just going back to materials, these are some prompts. Um, uh, when you think about talking to your different departments and content areas, um, kind of getting a temperature on what materials um, they are currently using or that you plan on using in the future. Um, do you have a vision for each content area for instruction? You know, what are your priorities um, for instruction and learning in that particular content area? What does that look like, sound like, feel like? Um, when you walk through the classroom, what are you looking for? Uh, in terms of instruction and learning in that classroom. Um, what work have you done or do you plan to do around adopting that curriculum or aligning that curriculum, especially if there's sort of new standards um, in the last year or two or that have just been adopted, what might that look like on timeline? And then 
if you have materials that you've adopted, what's your district belief on fidelity when it comes to using those materials um, for consistency purposes with teachers um, in order to guarantee that sort of equity of learning opportunity for um, students and maintaining grade level um, teaching? So those are some things to also think about uh, with your materials. There is just a timeline here. This is just from NDE. So uh, just to kind of gauge where those standards adoptions are um, and revisions. But what I wanna spend just the, the rest of the time on today is not just like what materials are adopted, but what's in those materials. And this comes from uh, the opportunity myth. Um, if you're familiar with that paper, and if not, I, I just I really encourage everyone to read it. But it really talks about the core of everything in our classrooms should be focused on uh, really great appropriate assignments, and that's directly connected to high quality instructional materials. Um, and so there's a couple of slides here that really talk about uh, you know having conversations with our teachers um, within departments. Um, about what we're asking our students to do and why we're asking them to do it. So when you adopt a high quality instructional material, typically those materials really are already guaranteed to be at grade level if they are you know, in the green um, on ed reports, et cetera. Um, but really, if, if you're not adopting new materials and you have materials that are just in place, you can still have these conversations and it's really important to have these conversations, um, asking teachers about when they're making decisions, is this task really giving our students the opportunity to meaningfully engage in grade level content that connects to actual our learning targets? Um, are there supports and scaffolds in place to help um, the students maintain that rigor uh, that we really need them to, to maintain at grade level? Um, and then there's some examples here of when teachers sort of create their own assignments or modify assignments, which go back to that question about fidelity. Um, sometimes what can happen in that modification is that the assignment and the work is no longer actually guaranteed at grade level. And uh, when we talk about depth of knowledge and what we're really asking students to do based on the standards, sometimes that meaning can be lost when those assignments are modified. And so there's a few um, examples here um, where there's a difference, a discrepancy in that depth of knowledge um, that can get lost when assignments are modified or are pulled from somewhere else that isn't guaranteed to be high quality. So if you have adopted materials, that then also leads to a conversation about how are we using them and what's our district expectation. So that word fidelity comes up um, about, you know, how closely do we expect our teachers to follow these materials that we have adopted? Um, what does that look like? Uh, what is the fidelity rate we expect? And how are we engaging in that process to ensure that um, if materials are being used, that they are maintaining that grade level rigor that we really need in order to ensure that our students are getting those equitable um, learning opportunities and that they are staying focused on standards, um, et cetera. So the last piece here is, what happens if we don't engage in this process and in these conversations, or we adopt materials without going through this process? These are some pitfalls that can happen. Even if you have purchased high quality instructional materials, but you haven't had a conversation about the use of them. So teachers burn out if they um, are provided materials or are not provided materials um, that, they, that require them to fill in gaps. And if they haven't internalized those materials, they don't know how to use those materials, or just they may be new and just don't have the experience with that process, it can lead to um, giving assignments uh, to students without having vetted exemplars so they can have experience before having to perform. Um, it can lead to giving assignments that are really disconnected from grade level standards because they were not aligned. That intellectual planning piece may not have been there. It doesn't really fit into the scope and sequence of expectation. Um, it can lead to giving assignments that are too low in rigor or over scaffolding assignments. So that rigor is really just no longer there. Um, 
And then it can also then lead to assigning or assessing homework that is really based on compliance rather than the learning targets. Um, and so then we're adding grades for compliance rather than learning. And then the very last part is it really just um, sets us up to lack tier one support and differentiation practices that are grounded in sound research, especially with young ex inexperienced teachers who just don't have that foundational knowledge and practice. Um, when they're faced with having to create things on their own or go buy them from teachers pay teachers, they're not only not vetting them, um, but they're not having those really important conversations about how does this change what I need to do in order to make sure I'm meeting all student needs. Um, and then that itself can lead to classroom management issues um, because they're spending so much time creating their materials that they're not necessarily um, working on just strategies and developing student relationships and, and whatnot in class. So there are some pitfalls um, if we don't have these conversations uh, when we're choosing materials. So I just wanna end with um, sort of prompting you to think about kind of what support you need or want um, and how we can help you here at the ESU in this process. Um, no matter where you are, we can step in and we're happy to help you wherever you are. Um, so I created this, it's a design, a curriculum design workbook. And this is really designed to help prompt thinking um, for teachers individually or by department, um, depends on you know what where where you are. Um, but also to support teachers who maybe come are coming into education and just don't have the foundational knowledge about how to put together a viable curriculum, um, or maybe your your district is not going to be able to spend the funds in a particular content area to get um, new high quality instructional materials. These are really good. Um, this is a really good process for teachers to go through, especially if they're building capacity on what a curriculum um, adoption process looks like. Um, and then it just breaks down the process, um, even as the individual level. So it can also be sort of a, an instructional coaching piece for a teacher um, to be reflective about their practice and maybe where there might be some uh, gaps that they need some support uh, in order to fulfill. So it's just full of sort of prompting questions about their content. Um, and then from there, these are the other services that we can offer. And uh, if you have a new teacher and they're just, you know, pretty, pretty raw and green and just don't have a real sound command of, you know, uh, implementing their curriculum, we can do individualized support. Um, but then we can also do whole, whole group uh, if that's kind of where you are as a district. So I left um, a question in the Jamboard again. Uh, if you prefer to uh, jump on there, you sure can. Um, but the second slide for the Jamboard is, what's your next right thing in HQIM? So if you are district and you need some support in a specific area or you just need to take that step, um, we invite you to just, you can put your district down if you'd like, uh, especially if you'd like us to follow up with you. Um, or you can just sort of reflectively put that information down and share that with us. We just invite you to do that if you would like. Um, you are welcome to reach out with any questions that you might have, and I'm really happy to follow up with you and, and help, um, help support you wherever you are in this cycle. Thank you. Very good, thank you so much, Katrina. Does anyone have questions about what she presented? I know I was um, last week with the statewide group um, looking at at some of this thing, some of this information, and there were some real eye openers for me. Some things I hadn't thought of that teacher burnout when we don't um, spend the time uh, deciding what our vision is and our materials um, can, and that's left on their plate alone. Um, that can really lead to that burnout something I hadn't hadn't thought of. And I'll quit talking if someone had a question. All right, other topics. Does anyone have any other topics that um, they thought, well, I'll ask when we get together at our 
principal Zoom. All right, I will, um, I see Katrina also has a social studies opportunity flyer in there. Do you wanna say anything about that, Katrina? You're, Katrina, you're on mute again. Yeah, my computer's acting really wonky, <laughs> sorry. Um, I just linked uh, ESU one and um, seven and eight are hosting um, a social studies uh, workshop at uh, NECC in February 9th um, and ESU2 and ESU17 are also going to be part of that where it's an NNNC opportunity. Um, we are working on hosting more of these across the state and uh, this will be an opportunity for teachers to really um, zoom in on what it means to have an inquiry driven social studies classroom, which is really the, the crux of the state standards um, in social studies. And also in that talking about what are high quality instructional materials um, in social studies, because we know that it's, uh, it's a unique and complex conversation uh, because there are no um, ed reports that offer that sort of green red rating, but we do have some resources for uh, schools and teachers, you know, to help them evaluate whether or not something is high quality instructional material for social studies. So it's going to be a training and inquiry that's really designed to help all teachers start really meeting those um, C3 standards, but also conversation about what high quality instructional materials look like for social studies. And I'm guessing there's a registration link on that flyer. Yes, there is a registration link. Um, we will be sending out an email because uh, we are um, doing it across multiple ESUs and ESU 8 is handling all the registration. So we're just making sure that uh, we have a script so people can start their accounts and, and get through that process easily. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, just a reminder that um, we will have another Zoom on December 15th. And Megan's going to join us and talk a little bit about MTSS and those fidelity checks um, on your core. And then on February 1st, we have our day two of um, putting out fires with Bess Sullivan Scott. And it, you can register. If you didn't attend day one, you can still attend day two. She will kind of just give a little bit of a brief review, but it doesn't necessarily um, have to build. So we would welcome you to come on February 1st um, at no cost to you guys. That is part of our teacher shortage grant. Um, we have put um, these this putting out fire series um, under that. So you can register there. Also, just a couple things. I will be sending out our annual stakeholder survey that we send out and I will send that to our superintendent and principal listserv. If you could send that on to your teachers, that would be greatly appreciated. That's just one of our data sources that we use um, when we look at um, our data digs and um, how we can grow and become better. So we appreciate all of your teachers and your support staff filling that out. It's fairly short, even shorter this year than last year. So. And then the last thing, if you are attending the winter workshop, and um, I would ask you to encourage your teachers to present um, what they're doing in their classrooms, um, if they're doing something systemically like with MTSS or um, maybe department-wise, please encourage them to present. There's a submission proposal form there, and we're taking proposals through December 1st. I should put that there. 